Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host Anthony Faso. We just interviewed Dave Zook, who has deployed more than 90 million of investors' capital into the ATM space. Great conversation, Anthony. What was your takeaway? Well, I'll tell you, you know what the, the first little. I know we're supposed to talk about ATM machines, but maybe the first five ten minutes we started talking about taxes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, but one thing I liked what he said is that you shouldn't pay tax on passive income. Yeah. Which I never heard it that way, and I, I think he's right. And what he talked about is with a strategy is one way that that you that you can do this. Mm -hmm. That not only investing in these ATM machines are going to provide uh, passive income, man, w w we can get a large tax deduction. Yeah. So to me, you know, I always always have a little soft spot in my heart for taxes. Um, what were some of your takeaways, Cam? Uh, the takeaway I had was this ATM space is very interesting. Mm -hmm. We had a great interview end of last year, early this year, with a gentleman that was teaching, will teach you how to build an ATM business, you know, from the ground up. This conversation is very, very different, just so you guys know. And so what Dave did is, for me, the two takeaways that I had is, one, he gave me a good kind of overall picture, a much bigger picture of the ATM space that I had. Mm -hmm. And then also, two, is he addressed two really big concerns uh, that kind of surround that ATM space is, hey, where are we going with this kind of cashless mm -hmm. push in society that we have? Mm -hmm. And are people still using cash as much as they used to? So, um you know, couple questions there. I like the way that he answered it. That was kind of the same question, but he gave us two responses, I guess is a better mm -hmm. way to say it. Mm -hmm. So uh, great interview by Dave. Really think you guys are going to appreciate this and uh, we'll be interested. Awesome. Dave Zook, right? Successful business owner, experienced real estate investor. He's active in multifamily, self-storage, and the ATM space. In fact, we're going to bring him back Yeah. Right to touch on those. He's acquired more than $100 million worth of real estate since 2010. And at the time of this writing, he and his investors own approximately 3,000 multifamily apartment units. And like I said before, as they deployed more than $90 million of investor capital into the ATM space. And he's also personally heavily invested in it as well. Now, I, I will preface, if you're watching this, uh, the video on YouTube, uh, he was having some internet problems, mm -hmm. right? And we almost rescheduled, but uh, we gave it a shot. Audio's good. But if you're watching this on YouTube, video maybe not so good. But we felt the content that he was delivering was so good that we're we're, we're still going to put it on YouTube. Yeah. So enjoy the episode. Take care. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast, where we teach clients how to build wealth and create passive income without the risk of Wall Street. Dave, hey man, thanks for being with us today. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Yeah, we're looking forward to it, too. Before we get into kind of uh, some of the meat of this interview, uh, give our listeners a little bit of your background, right? You've got a, a pretty interesting background. We'd love to share that with them. Yeah, so I was fortunate in that I grew up in a very entre entrepreneurial business uh, sort of family. And so I grew up in, in business. My dad uh, bought a manufacturing business the year I was born. We uh, so our family business is modular buildings. We build modular buildings. And I was growing up in that in that sort of environment. And I saw my dad investing in real estate. He was very successful in business. He started investing in real estate and farms and land and local properties and some single family homes. I saw him self manage some of those single family homes. And I just quickly realized that, you know, and this was when I was in my pre teens and teens. And I realized that uh, I wanted nothing to do with that. I, that wasn't going to be <laughs> me when I grew up. I, I wasn't going to be a real estate investor. So, anyway, so I went down the path of, of uh, starting and owning and partnering in business um, when I was in my late teens, early 20s. And I uh, got to the point where some of the businesses started doing really well, and I got into a tax problem. I started having to pay lots of money in tax, and mm. more than a decade ago, I, I, you know, I was paying a half million dollars a year in tax, and and it, you know, running businesses and and all that was. I mean, I, I was having all kinds of fun doing it when I had to give half my money back to the government. It wasn't so much fun anymore. And I started going down this path to figure out how I can live tax efficient. And I heard Robert Kiyosaki 
talking about how you could make millions of dollars a year and pay no tax legally. And I've heard Tom Wu right <laughs> making statements, you know, about, you know, how you could control your own tax liability, how, you know, if you want to change your, your, your tax, you got to change your facts. And, and so some of those, some of those, uh, you know, kind of one liners sort of changed my life and sent me down in this path of discovery and searching and, and, um, you know, I, I really got into the multifamily apartment space because I had a tax problem. So I ended up taking my tax liability from a half million dollars a year down to zero. And uh, it's stayed very close to zero for the last decade, all while, you know, several, you know, several times, uh, all while, um, five or 10 xing my income. And so, you know, this conventional thinking of, you got, you know, if you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of taxes, just not true. And uh, so I discovered that. And then discovering that I realized there was a lot of other people that thought conventional. And uh, mm -hmm. so today I, I teach, um, you know, how to invest, how to grow your wealth and how to live a tax efficient life. Well, that's, it sounds very intriguing. Uh, so, so how how did you get started? Like, what did you discover? So, you went down that road. You found multifamily, and what is it in multifamily that allowed you to offset that tax liability, Dave? Yeah, so several things. So, I started buying multifamily on my own. Bought a couple hundred units of my own. I was, you know, yeah. doing really well in business, and and um, bought a couple hundred units of my own. Um, I was using cost segregation studies. I was using bonus depreciation. I was using leverage. And, you know, within one year, uh, because I bought several large apartment buildings and used those strategies, I was able to take my half million dollar tax liability down to zero. And so just by using, you know, um, I made some changes. I changed the way, like Tom Wheelwright said, I changed the way I was behaving. I changed my facts. I, I didn't like my tax positions. So I changed my facts. I, I started transitioning more into the investment world and real estate investing and it became a real estate professional and started using, you know, my, my uh, depreciation, bonus depreciation, cost segregation, started taking those losses and offsetting the tax liability on my ordinary income, which was uh, a you know, game changer for me. And so those are the strategies that I started with and started using. And it's really not, that complicated it's basically uh today I, I teach this stuff next weekend i'll be in dallas teaching to, to you know three four hundred folks in dallas and and you know it's really as simple as taking an income stream whether that be ordinary income whether that be passive income whether that be capital gains income really taking an income stream and then finding an asset class that that provides the depreciation to offset the tax liability on that specific income stream. And so it's as simple as that, you know, I, I, you know, I had an investor telling me about how she's setting up, you know, some kind of a entity structure and then she's moving this, this, you know, the capital over here and then she's using some kind of, you know, life insurance product. And then she, you know, complicated, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, those things can be done, but they're hard, they're complicated. And unless you're immersed in those things, you're probably not going to remember how to do them. Uh, you know, it, our strategy is finding an asset class that provides the depreciation that offsets the tax liability on a specific stream of income. I heard something that's interesting in there. And what I'm hearing, you correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, is that you kind of started out looking at multifamily with from the tax perspective. I think a lot of people approach multifamily from the income stream mm -hmm. perspective. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, no, and and, and you know, in addition to um, building equity appreciation, building long term wealth, building streams of income, all of that stuff. I mean, that's that's all of the reasons why you should be investing in real estate and multifamily and. And, and some of those asset classes. But for me, um, I needed help. I needed, yeah. my, my most pressing issue was I had a half million dollar tax bill that I need to get rid of. And, you know, knowing all that other stuff came along with the package, it's all good. But for me, my most immediate need, I led with my need and my most immediate need was I want to keep the money I was making. So, so you were kind of got into this just uh, for a personal reason. Where did uh, when did you start the real asset investor? 
sort of the real asset investor, not quite 10 years ago. Personally, I was, I've, I've been an investor and an entrepreneur all my adult life. So, I mean, I was yeah. an investor long before I started the real asset investor as an entity, as a business to help other people kind of sort of do what I was already doing. And that's yeah. really what we do at its core is we, I take things that work for me. Um, I take my problems and figure out how to fix my problems. And I take asset classes that I really love. I take operator teams that I really love. And then I share it. I take it to my investors and I say, hey, this, this, is, this is what I'm doing for myself. And you know, it, it, it's sort of a two-pronged approach. On the one side, I'm helping an investor um, get what they want. That is to live the more tax efficient life, build income streams, build wealth. On the other side, I'm working with a, a very, um, I'm working with an operator that's, you know, very proficient in the asset class that they're operating. And I'll give you an example. Um, I we're doing business with a self storage operator, one of the best self storage operators in the country. Uh, we just rolled up 26 of our of our self storage properties last November and sold them to a REIT out of Chicago. And it was a, it was a big institutional deal. And our investors netted 30 to 31 percent annualized on average in that portfolio. And so, you know, just being able to to kind of tap into the operator, come alongside of them, be a funding source for them, help them grow and scale their business on that side and then helping the investor uh, build wealth on this side. It's kind of a two-pronged approach, and that's what we do best. And, and it really starts, I mean, it's going to sound incredibly selfish, but it really starts with me. I mean, it starts with what do I want? What do I want to invest in? And why do I want to invest in that asset class? And then, you know, once I have my problem taken care of, when we got that sort of infrastructure built with the team and all that, then I take it to my investor and say, hey, this is an option. This is an asset class that you might want to consider. And I can uh, I can appreciate that. I think that uh, Anthony and I have shared our story on our podcast over the years, and mm. it's a very similar story, right? We were trying to solve our own problems that we had. We came across something that was successful, and then we just started sharing it, right? That's what I'm hearing you say as well. Dave, also I heard that uh, you were in multifamily and self-storage, um, but tell us how you got started in ATMs. So while I was building my um uh, multifamily uh asset class portfolio while i was doing that i uh, started I, I really got into the syndication space space by accident i was um i was raising money for uh self-storage i had i had bought a bunch of units of my own ran out of my own money uh now i've got the team set up so i started you know inviting friends and family and business associates into the deal and sort of just kind of became a, a syndicator without really trying. Um, so I was doing all that and I was making passive investments with a local, uh, with a couple of local operators here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I started investing passively in ATMs. And uh, these were, you know, highly regarded uh, business guys in the area, well-respected business guys. I thought it was very interesting. At 100% bonus depreciation, cash flows in the 20 plus percent range. I'm like, man, what's not the like? So I started, I started investing with them passively. Uh, this went on from 2012 to about 2016. They came to me in 2016 and said, "Hey, we're 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 seeing what you're doing over in the multifamily uh, space." Um, we just signed on a large portfolio of ATMs, come help us. And so I joined the team, I partnered with them. Um, really, we took that business from a small mom and pop sort of, or a small friends and family sort of uh, operation, a uh, small kind of fun for friends and family. And um, we've really scaled that business since 2016. And today we're one of the top four ATM operators in the country. Hmm. Awesome. You you mentioned uh, we had a gentleman on that we interviewed late last year. I think it was December. Yeah. But uh, we interviewed him, and he, what he does is he helps individuals build kind of an ATM business. What I heard you say is you bought a portfolio. Can you maybe highlight the differences or what you guys are doing? Because I think there is a pretty big difference yeah. between 
our previous a- ATM conversation and what you're talking about here. Yeah, so we're not we're not going into single locations, you know, restaurants, bars, trying to trying to acquire these. We're 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 dealing with institutional grade portfolios, and we're also not putting. Uh, typically, we're not putting new ATMs in new locations. When we're when we're buying a portfolio of ATMs, there could you know it could be a five, ten, fifteen, twenty million dollar purchase, and we're buying existing ATMs in existing locations, and we're unseating somebody. We're coming in and taking over those positions, and and that's important for a couple reasons. Number one, um, and probably most important is we're taking a lot of risk out of the deal. Uh, we know exactly how many locations that portfolio has delivered over the last couple of years. We know we can drill down into the location and know exactly how many transactions that specific location did in the last 12, 24, 36 months. The other thing that's important, we're not, we're not, um, uh, we're, we're not putting a bunch of new ATMs in a bunch of new locations and, and getting, in, getting into the point where we're saturating a market. So we're taking over the locations, reducing a lot of risk because we're doing our homework ahead of time. So what I'm hearing is that the locations are already proven to be profitable. If we're doing a new location, there's a, we don't have that history of transactions that it could be profitable or it could, it, it could not. Yeah. I mean, so, so what's the, what, what does a bank or a lender want to see or, or a buyer want to see when they're going in to buy a multifamily apartment building, they're going to ask for a T12. They want to see the history. They want to see where the money is coming from and that it's consistent. Um, that's exactly what we're doing in the, in the ATM space. We're, we're going in, we're getting that, we're getting that operating history. We're getting that transaction history. We want to see that this is a proven location. And that takes a lot of risk out of the deal for our investors. You know, Dave, let's just maybe just first make some people who might be new to the ATMs uh, or as a business, because a lot of people probably assume all ATMs are owned by banks. So do you want to allude to, to the difference between bank owned and privately owned and how does an ATM make money? So many people believe that banks own the ATMs, but I will tell you that even the ATMs inside the banks, many times those aren't bank owned. Those are owned by us. Um, the other thing is when you walk into a Wawa or a Sheets, a convenience store, and they have the, the sign hanging there, it's like free ATM you know, surcharge, no, you know, no fees. Well, there is a fee. They're just covering that fee for you because they're hoping you take 50 bucks out of the machine and, and buy a whole bunch of, of stuff in their store. Either way, you don't get a free, you know, you, you, there, there are fees, even though you, the consumer, might not be paying the fees. But we're collecting those fees when we have our ATMs in those stores. So typically what happens, you walk up to the ATM, you swipe your card, you get your cash out, and there's a $2.50, $2.50 to $3.50 surcharge that gets applied to your uh, to the cost to, to make that transaction happen. Uh, on the other end of that surcharge, there's an investor that's making a nice juicy profit from that transaction. Now, I would kind of my first reaction is like, I, I'm not using, I, I rarely use cash. And when I do, I'm not paying that convenience fee. Um, I mean, we're always hearing that we're going to a cashless society. Where, how would that impact ATMs? What do you what 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 would what do you like? What's your favorite asset class? What do you like to invest in? Real estate. Cameron likes hair products, but <laughs> I like real assets, like real estate. You're talking like real estate, like as in multifamily apartment buildings, ABC class, any any of that. Do well, I? I personally, I like single family. Okay, so I've had people say to me exactly what you said. I don't use cash, so why would I invest in that deal? And those same people, um, you know, I know have invested in B and C class, you know, multifamily apartment buildings. And my answer is, well, you invest in B and C class multifamily apartment building, but you would never live there with your family, right? I mean, and, and so 
what you got to what you got to remember is you and I, and probably most of the people on um, you know listening to this um, show, are not our customers. We've long since transitioned to plastic, and and so we don't use cash. I very seldom use cash, and I don't use an ATM. I I couldn't get money. I own hundreds of ATMs personally. I couldn't get I couldn't get money out of an ATM machine if I wanted to. I don't have an ATM card. Um, here's who our customer is. Our customer is the a lower income EBT card carriers. They're unbanked. They're underbanked. Um, they're immigrants. They, you know, they're they're using this ATM as their bank. They're sending money overseas. They're che- they're they're cashing checks. They're you know, there's there's all kinds of things that they're using this ATM for. Now picture this. So there's a guy who used to work in a factory and who used to get a check every Friday night or every other Friday night. Today, that doesn't happen. That ch- that, that now all that money is ACH into his bank account. So he walks out of his C-class multifamily apartment building. He walks down to the, to the corner deli. He takes out 20 or 30 bucks in cash and he goes and buys cigarettes. And Or he takes, uh, the, you know, she takes her EBT card uh, that she can't um used to buy prepared foods and she goes over to the atm can quickly converts it into cash now she can buy whatever she wants um so those are the type of customers that we're servicing and when you realize it's one of the fastest growing demographics in this country then this business model starts making a lot of a lot more sense interesting now where i've i've heard of these uh, crypto machines, these crypto ATM machines, are you involved with that or what do you see in regards to those? Yeah, so our um, management team uh, owns about 1,500 of these BTM machines. Um, the, it's, it's funny that you asked in the timing of the question because we <laughs> just finished the investment summary and we're getting ready to launch the fund uh, later on this month. So yes, it is a, we have a proven business model. We own about 1500 of the, of the BTMs. Um, and the margins are even better on the BTM side than they are on the ATM side. And it's, uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. This is something, this is something that's been in the works for us for the last, um, year and a half to two years. And we're finally launching the fund looks like this month. How are you, where are you guys going to acquire these, right? Are you, you said you're not going to kind of mom and pops. What are you acquiring and how many do you guys have right now? So we got about 1500 uh, BTMs. Uh, we're acquiring, we're, we're, we're buying the, the uh, machines brand new. Um, and, you know, we've, we've had these in service, in operation for the last, you know, 18 to 24 months. So you guys are coming in, fi- buying a package of these things and then putting in a new machine. I thought I'd heard earlier that they were already in an established location. Those, those are different because there's so few of them. There's not you know portfolios available like there is in the ATM space. But we do mm-hmm. know that many of okay. Those, okay. Uh, those same people that are using our ATM machines are also using BTMs. And so we're able to – we got a huge – advantage to somebody who's just new to market and going to be placing BTMs uh, because we already have the relationships with the convenience stores and with our partners who, you know, already um, have our ATMs in their store. Now we'll be able to leverage those relationships further and just put a BTM right beside it. Oh, so you're going to put them, put them right next to each other. Yeah, the, the, the ideal scenario, and this is, you know, kind of a joke, but the ideal scenario is where you would go in and, and, and take cash out of the ATM machine and put <laughs> that cash into the BTM machine and you'd get Bitcoin with it. Oh, perfect. I, and I can imagine they eventually might make one machine that did both, I would assume. Well, they do and they have, and some of our ATMs are BTM compatible, but what we found is the... Um, the performance on a standalone BTM is so much better than if it's a hybrid. Interest. Hmm. That, that is, that is very interesting. Now, Dave, like, tell us what this looks like. If somebody were to invest, 
what, what exactly are they getting and how much does it take? Yeah. Yep. So uh, you're investing into a fund. Uh, you as an investor own a small piece of the fund. It's no different than if you were investing in a multifamily apartment building, you don't own a piece of the multifamily apartment building, you own a piece of the entity that owns the building. Okay. So you're mm -hmm. investing in a fund. Let's say you invest in you, you invest in a unit of ATMs, which is five or six ATM machines for $104,000. We then take those ATM machines and put them in our fund. Those get managed by a third party uh, ATM management company, which has some overlap in, in ownership in our partnership team. Um, but those get managed by the ATM management company and you get a piece of the revenue. And typically what you can expect from that revenue split or revenue share is it's sort of a, a three pronged approach where, you know, the, 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 the customer uh, swipes the card. That's a, let's, let's just call that a $3 transaction. Mm -hmm. Um, Roughly 40% of the revenue goes to the management company where all of the costs and overhead and fees and, and, you know, from maintenance to cash delivery and all the costs flow through to the management company. The management company gets roughly 40% of that $3 surcharge. And then it goes to the uh, location owner. Uh, to service the location agreement. And that can be through a fixed rent or it can be through a some sort of revenue share or more often it can be a combination of both. Um, and then there's about a 30% split with the investor. Now, those, you know, that that is variable and those, those mm -hmm. uh, that fee structure varies from fund to fund and portfolio to portfolio, but that's kind of the general idea, pretty much kind of a 40, 30, 30 split. Okay. And can you disclose about what that, what the investor would look at getting? Sure. Yeah. So uh, right now uh, we have a fund or for the last, Roughly 12 months, we had this fund open. The fund pays uh, $2,142 per unit. So you make $104,000 investment, you get $2,142 per unit. And that's a seven-year contract. So the way those returns look, it's a 24.5% cash-on-cash return. Uh, but the IRR is really what you want to pay attention to because when you look at just a straight-out return, you're, you're really – owning the ATM machines, but what you're doing is you're, you're purchasing a cash flow stream and a tax, ben, uh, tax benefit. So consider what it would look like um, if you were to buy five or six laptop computers. That's really what you're doing when you're buying a piece of technology, you're buying an ATM. You're not buying the ATM for the ATM, you're buying the ATM to facilitate and getting you that cash flow stream and that tax uh, benefit. So really what happens is that 24.5% cash on cash return on the front end is not reflective of the loss of value of your equipment over that seven year period. So when you look at it from an IRR perspective, then you're around a 19% IRR. So, you know, unlike in what you would consider in real assets where the cash flow is low, lower and the IRR is higher, here it's just the opposite where your IRR is lower than, than your actual cash flow because you consider the value you know, the decreasing gotcha. or declining value of your asset over that seven year period. Okay. Now explain the tax benefits. That's one of the most fun things about this investment. Okay. So we never start with tax. We want to make sure this investment works. We want to make sure you build wealth and build income streams and all that. Mm -hmm. But this is one of my favorite tax planning weapons. I mean, 100% bonus depreciation in, in year one is hard to argue with. And, you know, as you can imagine, Q4 is, uh, you know, our activity ramps up because I use it for my tax planning. And there's a lot of people that use it for their tax planning. You get 100% bonus depreciation. You can come in as late as October and you can get 100% bonus depreciation for that year. So what that looks like is you make that $104,000 investment into one unit of ATM machines. Your K1 shows up in Q1 of the following year, and you're showing $104,000 loss for making that investment. And then, and, and, and here's, here's the beauty of that. So 
let's take let's say you're a high pay let's say you're a, a, a an investor with a in, in the high tax bracket so you take that tax saving which is a which is a direct impact on your on your tax liability you never have to recapture that that depreciation so you really got to count that as income because it comes right off the bottom of your tax bill and you never recapture it so you take your tax savings then you take your first 12 months of cash flow you got 60 to 70 percent you got 60 to 70 percent of your principal uh, back in your pocket and you've still got an additional six years of cash flow beyond that okay david hold up okay that was some good stuff i'm still at writing your check for 104 and then taking a, a deduction for 104. <laughs> that is, that's pretty cool. Uh, super cool. So is that, is that because that 104 is allocated to the purchase of the machines? That's because you're investing in, in new, new equipment and that new equipment has, uh, this year, uh, this year yet you get a hundred percent bonus depreciation against new equipment. Hmm. Now, I would assume that this is considered a passive loss. Correct. Okay. So in order to deduct that, we're going to have those limits, those passive loss limits. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. One, it is passive activity. Mm -hmm. uh, it will offset your passive income. It will offset capital gains and offset depreciation recapture. Okay. So let's say uh, you're a W2 employee and you don't have other passive activity, uh, passive gains, passive cash flow that you can't, and you can't use that, uh, those passive losses, that $104,000 depreciation we just talked about. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that it goes wasted. That means that it just sits there in a bucket and it waits till you're ready, it waits till you provide that cash flow, which comes from your ATM investment. So, the most conservative way to use that is just let that set in a bucket and then you let your cash flow, you know, you get, let your cash flow accumulate and, and that gives you tax free cash flow for the next four years. So while you're still a W2 employee and you're making ordinary income, now you're starting to build your, your passive income column. And even after you get beyond the next four years and, and now it starts, now your income starts getting taxed. Now you're talking passive income and you got all kinds of different ways you can offset tax liability on passive income. W2 you know income. What you could do, Dave. Maybe you buy, get, write you another check for 104000 And then we could, now we have those passive uh, income that we could deduct those losses. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's what it's about. You know, at the end of the day, you know, one of the goals for me early on was to make my path, get my passive income to the point where it, exceed, where it exceeds my ordinary income. And, you know, you should never pay tax on your passive income. Um, you know, you should never pay tax on your ordinary income either, but that's a lot harder. <laughs> um, you know, you, you just got to use more advanced strategies and the options are fewer on that side. On the passive income side, your options are pretty much unlimited. I mean, you can you can invest in a lot of things and offset the tax liability on your passive income. So then they, I know there's a lot of people that unfortunately have a lot of their wealth tied up in 401ks and IRAs. Um, and, you know, they can, you know, convert that into a self-directed IRA what, what do you think on using that money? I mean, we're going to lose the tax deductions, but what's what's your thought on using qualified money? So it's not terrible. Um, you you leave some uh, you leave some benefit. You leave some margin on the table when you can't um, uh, harvest those tax benefits. And and here's where it's especially. Uh, important to remember when you do that in a self storage facility, and and you, you know you can't use the tax benefits. Okay, when you sell the self storage facility, you 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 know now you don't have to do a recapture because you never harvested those tax benefits anyway. Well, here it's a little bit different because you never recaptured this depreciation. So if you don't use it, you lose it. 
And so at the end of the day, it still delivers, like if you strip out all of the tax benefits and you just consider the cash flow and you consider the loss of value of your equipment over that seven, seven year period, it, it's still a double digit return. So it's not terrible. Yeah. You just leave some margin on the table. You know, I'm now now you got my brain ticking. And Dave, I know you're not giving tax advice, nor are we. <laughs> okay. But one theory I was thinking is if assuming you had some passive income, maybe from another syndication or another business, and you had this money inside an IRA, you could withdraw it, take take a withdrawal. So now your tax, you have to claim that as income. But we turn around and put it in your in your syndication, and we can, in theory, offset that money, a way for us to take away the tax from our IRA. Um, so, almost um, one of the things that uh, that one of the reasons we don't like uh, investing in Wall Street products, which is Oftentimes, what you know, four hundred one ks, and it, you know, yeah. a lot of those the retirement accounts are are invested in. Many people don't even realize what they're invested in, but they're you know typically being managed or invested in some sort of Wall Street product, ETFs, whatever. Um, you would think that when you purchase a an Apple stock or an ETF, you hit the buy button. Uh, you, 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 you make the purchase, you sit on it for 10 years, you turn around and sell it in 10 years. That's, that should, I mean, that, that's pretty passive, right? I mean, you don't actively run the business. You don't, you know, you're not actively involved. You don't do anything. And you know, it should be pretty passive, correct? So, so, but what happens is you get taxed on that as ordinary income. So, yeah. so you can't take passive activity like an ATM investment or like a, you know, like a um, syndication that you invested in and you're investing with an operator or whatever, you can't take those losses to offset the tax liability on that 401, on that gain in your 401 many times. So that's the other reason why we like to invest in real assets yeah. uh, that deliver cash flow and that provide that real value and upside is because you're not bound to those rules and, and you, they don't get you coming and going and, and you have some options. There, you're not getting taxed at, at ordinary income like you do when you um, cash out of your 401k or, or, or your retirement accounts. Now, I would say, Dave, this sounds great. I mean, it's very <laughs> interesting. But you want just being real, every time we talk to somebody with a syndication or some business plan, it always sounds great, right? Or there they wouldn't be promoting it. But I, I got to imagine that there's pros and cons to everything. And there's, I'm sure that there's some risks in investing in this. You mind sharing what some of those uh, could be, Dave? Yeah. So uh, you're talking about risks in the ATM business. Yeah. Yeah. So when I when I see uh, the risk in in the ATM business, I mean, it, there's there's really one risk, and that is, you know, we we make our money on the volume of the transactions that happen at our at our ATMs. So mm -hmm. the risk is that the, that, the, that the volume would decline. And so then you would got to ask the question, okay, what could make that volume decline? Uh, well, it could be people could use in cash or it could be, um, you know, that, that's, that's really, in my mind, that's really the number one risk. You know, because mm -hmm. as long as people are using cash, uh, there will be a need for a mobile bank or a an ATM machine, and so you, you asked the, you you made mention of this a couple of minutes ago about you know um, you know digital currency and you know what that's going to look like you know I, I guess I'm a little bit calloused to those conversations just simply because I've been hearing them for the last you know, yeah. eleven years ever since I got into the space. You know, back then it was Apple Pay, it was Google Wallet, it was some of those, you know, new technologies that were coming on. And, and you know, you can go back as far as in the 1990s where there was articles in the Wall Street Journal that talked about the death of cash and we're only going to be using cash for a couple more years. And, and so that talk has been going on for a very long time. And what we've seen is despite Apple Pay, Google Wallet, uh, Venmo, Cash App, 
uh, cryptocurrencies. And, and, and I mean, the list goes on. Despite all that, the use of cash has grown and has more than doubled in the last decade. Hmm. And so we would, con uh, th there's this subset of the population that has used cash all of their life and we would expect them to use cash for the next decade or more. Dave, I've got, I've got a question for you. You mentioned that uh, you were personally investing in ATMs, I think all the way back to 2012, if I remember, right? Yes. Did you hear that accurate? What, uh, what opportunities are you looking at now, right? That, uh, you know, what opportunities do you see in the marketplace today? So I eat my own cooking. I, I will make another seven figure investment in ATMs this year. In fact, we were just, uh, just talking about this, this this morning. Um, I am my largest investment this year will be in the car wash space. Uh, the, the largest investment that I've made to date this year is in the car wash space. And you know, the, I really just take uh, my, you know, like I was explaining before, that stream of income, you know, whether it's ordinary income, whether it's passive income, whether it's capital gains, have I sold anything? I really just take my picture and I say, okay, what do I need to do to offset the tax liability in those different asset classes or those different income streams? I got to find an asset class that matches up with that income stream and knocks down the tax liability on that income. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I mean, the asset classes that you see uh, us go to market with, our asset classes, those are the asset classes that I'm investing in personally. So I, I'll, I'll make, I'll have heavy investments in the ATM space. I'll have heavy investments in car wash space, biggest investment I've made this year. I'll invest in, I mean, I have some energy investments that I like. Self-storage is another one. I love self-storage. Uh, I was just talking to a guy this morning about data centers and, you know, he was, he sold his tech company. They, they, they service data centers. Those data centers in the last, decade has been the only commercial asset class that has outperformed uh, self-storage. And that happened in the last two years. Prior to that, you know, mm. coming out of 2008, 9, and 10, you know, uh, self-storage was the best performing uh, commercial asset class, commercial real estate asset class in the country. And so I like self-storage for a number of reasons. One of the reasons, uh, one of my favorite reasons is it does really, really well in times of disruption, um, pandemics, uh, recessions, di uh, divorce, downside, dislocation, all, all those things. Uh, and, and it provides stability to a portfolio that, you know, where, you know, if, if everything else goes bad, typically self-storage shines. And self-storage does really well, even in good times. Dave, I, tell you, I would love to have you back on to talk about car wash. That's a topic um we haven't addressed so we'd love we'd love to have you back if you're willing i would love to come back self-storage is uh one of my favorites just simply one of one of the reasons is because of the opportunity that i see in the marketplace it is a very fragmented um asset class or business mm -hmm. uh it's like five percent of uh car washes are owned by institutions the rest are owned by mom and pops and and individuals um, the institutional appetite, private equity institutional appetite for this asset class is off the charts. Um, we, you know, one of my partners was, uh, very involved at JP Morgan. He was a very high paid, um, uh, deal maker. And, uh, you know, he was, he was on the deal maker side of JP Morgan. And so he comes to us, he was like, Hey, uh, the last four car wash, tunnel wash portfolios that have traded, and have traded in the, you know, around a 20 X multiple, 20 times EBITDA. And so, and then it was interesting, like uh, two weeks uh, to about two weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal came out with a big old article. And I wrote about this in a newsletter of mine that, that talked about it. You know, they were saying, you know, the average uh, tunnel wash, their, their earnings are X and, and um, you know, the, the, you know, they're trading at 18 to 20 X multiples. And you know, the other's like, like, yeah, yeah, we know. And it was sort of a confirmation, but it was, it, you know, it, it is a, it's an exciting space right now. And we're really uh, racing to get to 50 or 60 car washes in the next four years. And we plan to, to sell into that, uh, in, into those kind of multiples. 
Dave, two things as we wrap up here. If somebody's listening and they want to reach out to you, where can they get a hold of you at? The best place to go is info at therealassetinvestor.com. And that's also on our website, therealassetinvestor.com. Uh, but info at therealassetinvestor.com gets all of us. It gets my team. And if uh, well, some of your folks reach out to us, we will get back to them. Uh, we're very... We're very uh, prompt with that. So info at therealassetinvestor.com is the best place to go. Great. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes. And then the other one was you alluded to the fact you're going to be teaching in Dallas. Maybe share a little bit about what that event looks like. Is that a one-day, two-day event? Who should be there? That's a two-day event. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the secrets of successful syndication put on by the real estate guys. I've been a faculty member there for the last, I don't know, five, six years. And uh, so that's uh, that's a twice a year event. And uh, it's one that I like to go to. Um, I, that's typically an every six month deal for me. I mean, I, I, I rarely miss one. And the reason I rarely miss one, number one, I love teaching this stuff. Number two, actually, you know what? I'll make the other one number one. Number one, the quality of people in the room, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they know how to attract a good crowd. And the quality of people in the room is amazing. Um, just be able to, you know, it's kind of gotten to be my tribe over the last decade. And, um, you know, number two is you're, you know, I like, I like doing this stuff. I like teaching people that, you know, conventional wealth, I mean, a uh, conventional thinking probably isn't going to get you where you want to go. And to be able to kind of put a twist on that and say, here's what you ought to really be thinking about. And here's the options that are really open to you. And this is how it really works in the real world. If you want to build wealth, one of the, one of the, one of the biggest crusher of dreams in building wealth is when you got to pay a 40% tax. <laughs> and so if you can get rid of that, uh, you're on your way to freedom uh, much more quickly and efficiently. Well said, Dave. I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks for thanks for being on today. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Go make it a fantastic day. Take care. All right. See you guys. Thanks for listening. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode. Also, check out our website, InfiniteWealthConsultants.com, to find our podcast along with other additional resources.